man, I'm excited about today. I'm excited about next week. I'm excited about the next few weeks. We got so much going on here. Are you excited about Vacation Bible School? Oh, can't you wait to, see, to hear the stories next Sunday of what God did? Oh, I can't wait to hear about little children who got to hear the glorious gospel message and how some of the children have given their life to Christ. Next Sunday is going to be a celebration, uh, Chris and Joanne. We're going to have a big party next Sunday morning, celebrating what God has done. Amen? Amen. We're going to talk about people, children giving their lives to the Lord, and uh, we're going to get excited about it. Last year at this time, we were gearing up for the three-on-three tournament. This is, uh, this is the first place trophy for this year, isn't it beautiful? The Copa del Calvario, uh, getting ready for that next Monday, a week from Monday. We need help. Uh, we got a sign-up sheet in the back on the left as you go out. Uh, we need help with everything. Uh, food, drinks, grill, people to grill, uh, just to show the love of Jesus to the Latino community. And we're going to offer a cup of water in Jesus' name, amen? And it's going to be a good time. Pray for us. I'm going to be real honest with you. The adversary has really came up against us in this tournament. Um, last year was, was the greatest response to the gospel we've ever had. Um, it was amazing. Um, it, it still is mind-blowing to me what God did at the tournament last year. And um, this year, this is how it's gone so far. Um, we've lost all of our referees. We have one referee for next Saturday, or next Monday. Um, Aaron Hessen loves soccer. He's going to referee for it. I'm just kidding. He hates soccer. Uh, absolutely dis despises soccer, but he comes and he helps. <clears throat> We've lost all our referees, except for one. Um, word out on the street is we're not even having the tournament this year. And uh, so we've only got three teams so far, uh, which is very odd. And um, Satan is just doing everything he can to discourage us. But we're going to have the tournament if I'm the only one there. Because I know I'm not going to be the only one there. You'll be there, and it's going to be a great opportunity for us to show the love of Christ once again. But I am going to ask you to do two things. This week is vitally important. We need you to pray for Vacation Bible School. Huge, huge opportunity to share the gospel, to share the love of Christ with a bunch of children who need to know that Jesus loves them. What an opportunity. And then next Monday, a week from tomorrow um, after church next Sunday if there's anybody that wants to stick around I'm sure, I'm sure there's gonna be plenty to do we need to set up all of our canopies and get everything ready for Monday morning when they start rolling in uh, and and we pray and then we begin the tournament if anybody wants to help out next Sunday um, after church uh, we'll just get together maybe maybe some of us can get together and buy some pizzas and hang out a little bit and just do a little bit of work the pre the pre work for the tournament and then, uh, of course, be praying for what happens on Monday. There's a lot of stress and a lot of pressure to get this tournament done and to do it right because we are reflecting Christ. And um, we always want to do it right. We always want to do it in such a way that, to where God is, is glorified. I'm not so much worried about who wins the trophy, but I'm more worried about who will be here, who will be able to hear the glorious gospel message, which is what we're about. Um, so please be in much prayer. And then... Uh, in two weeks, uh, two weeks from yesterday, we leave, the teenagers and I, we leave for uh, Word of Life Bible Camp in Scroon at Lake New York. We got a lot going on, man. So I definitely cover your prayers, need your prayers, want your prayers, and uh, certainly, certainly, certainly need you to be praying for me as, uh, as God's doing some amazing things. Amen? Are you excited? Amen. Wasn't it a great worship time this morning? Oh, that was just beautiful. Thank you. I so appreciate the song selection goes right along with what God is going to do today. Um, I, I got here a little bit early this morning after preaching at, at the Latino church, only to find out that Pastor Dave was actually preaching from the same exact passage of Scripture that I am using today in Hebrews chapter 10. So if you've got your Bibles, please turn to Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to be looking at verses 19 through 26. Wonderful passage of Scripture. It's an exciting passage of Scripture. And... Uh, we're going to read through <clears throat> verses 19 through 25, and then we're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to jump right into what ha God has for us today. And the Bible says, therefore, brethren, and I'll be reading this out of the ESV, therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter into the holy places by the blood of Jesus, now the new and living way he opened for us through the curtain, that is the veil, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest, a great priest over the house of God, let us, 
draw near with a true heart, full of assurance of faith, with pure water. Or pardon me, with, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope or our faith without wavering. For he who promised being God is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works. Not neglecting the meeting, not neglecting the meeting together as it habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Father God, right now we pray that the Holy Spirit would fill us. We pray that you would fill this place. Father God, there's different needs that each one of us have today. There are some here today, Father, that needs encouragement. And I pray that you would use your holy word to bring great encouragement to them. They've had, some hard, they've had a hard week. They've seen the news of what's happening all over our beautiful state. They've been affected through family or friends in one way or another. And Father, they need some encouragement. And I pray that you would give them encouragement. Father, I pray that there may be some here today that don't know Jesus as their Savior, but they've come to church today in search of hope. And I pray, Father, that they would find their hope, their faith, their strength in you. And maybe, Lord, today would be the day of salvation for them, where their name would be written in the Lamb's Book of Life and their eternal destiny would be forever changed. Lord, I pray for those that are sick. And there's a lot in our church that are really suffering with illness. Praying, Father, for your divine pleasure to touch their bodies and bring healing to their souls and to their bodies. And Father, I'm praying that me as your servant would be filled and anointed with the Holy Spirit right now. And God, I place myself on the altar, asking you to use me for your honor and for your glory. Praying, Father, that you would guide my mind, my thoughts, my tongue, and my actions. And Lord, above all else, I pray that you would be honored and, and, and glorified because you are worthy. You are the lamb that is worthy. So Father, I just pray that you would take these next few moments as we look into your holy word. And I pray that you would speak to each one of us in Christ's name. Amen. Aren't you glad we serve a God who loves us? Aren't you glad that we, you are serving a God who is asking you to be a participant in his harvest? Isn't that wonderful? God wants you and I to be participants, not spectators, in his heart. He wants us to be participants in everything that we are getting ready to do for the honor and for the glory of God. And we are looking for you to partner with us at Calvary Baptist Church to do just that. To bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we partner to bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, we are also praying that God would use Calvary Baptist Church as a lighthouse to bring people to know Jesus as their Savior. Amen? Amen. That is the reason I exist. I exist for the honor and for the glory of God. I want nothing more than to see you as a congregation growing in your relationship with Christ, partnering with one another in the ministry, bringing lost people to Christ, bringing lost people to the church, and seeing lives change for the glory of God. Amen? That is what I am about. And I'm hoping that as we partner together, that you capture the vision, that you capture the excitement, that you capture the joy that there is in serving Jesus, and that we will go do great things for the glory of God. I would ask each one of you just to look around the church today. Just everybody just, just kind of look around. I see some beautiful faces. You are beautiful people. But you know what else I see? Five pews without anybody in them. And if I would count, there'd be a whole lot more. You know what that means? That means we've got a lot of work to do, don't we? I don't look at this, and I pray that you don't look at this with discouragement. Unless you're going to use that discouragement as a motivator. For me, when I look here, it's a great motivation, amen? We, we, have, got, we have got to get to the point where we're willing to talk to people about Christ individually, corporately, as we partner together to see this church flourish for the, God, for the cause of Christ. I want to see growth. I want to see Christian growth in your life. I want to see God do amazing things in you to where you are bringing people to Christ. And what happens is this, this thing is going to spread. It's kind of going to be like, it's going to, if it happens, it's going to take you making decisions to make it happen. I'm going to give you the word. I'm going to challenge you. God's going to challenge you. But the decision ultimately is going to be in your hands what we're going to do with this. Right. Amen? Yep. So when we look around, we say, okay, we got one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, you can't count the first pew because we're Baptists. And no Baptist is everyone. 
I'm sorry, you're not Baptist today, sweetheart. There's no Baptist that's ever going to sit on the front pew, okay? It's illegal for a Baptist to sit on the front pew. So bring some Presbyterians, and we'll put them right there, and they'll be good, okay? So, we've got to get this whole vision of we got, we've got to do more. And I don't mean just by being busy. I don't think we need to be busier. I'm not talking about being busier, but it's about being involved in the work that God wants us to do. Yesterday was amazing. Uh, I got to speak at the food pantry, and I, I, I absolutely love the food pantry. I have so many friends that, that come to the food pantry, and I, they're, they're just beautiful, awesome people. And some of them, we, we, we laugh and we joke, and they hug me and I hug them. It's just, it's just awesome. But you know, there was... A tr- there was, how many was here yesterday? Yes. 80 families, how many people? 224 people. Um, 224 people heard the gospel yesterday. But you know what I noticed yesterday as I was sharing the gospel? People was nodding their head. I would talk about the love of Christ, and they were like, oh, yeah, man. Yeah, I get that. And, and you know what I did? I asked them in a roundabout way to partner with us. Come, be a part of our church, amen? Wouldn't that be awesome? I'm not looking for just rich people or poor people. Anybody that, that needs Jesus needs to be here. Right. It's, not about, it's not about an offering plate. Right. It's about a person's eternal destination. It's not about what they can give. It's about what we can give them. Amen? Right. Yeah. So when we, when we talk about this whole partnership, find out what, what your role is and what part you can play as we partner together to bring others to Christ. Real quick, here we're going to jump into the word now that we had our introduction. The phrase that we see three times in this passage of scripture is, let us. Let us. It was never, there was never a let me. It was let us. It's a corporate thing. It's a, it's a partnership. Let us. And it's interesting. The, the word let us is used 61 times in the New Testament alone. And over 180 tes- uh, 80 times in, in the whole Bible. Interesting. Let us. Let us. God does not want us to do something individually. Oh, he does want us to do something individually. But he's calling us to be a partner or part in a partnership so that the gospel goes forward. Is it easy to stand alone? No. Is it easier when you're standing with a group of people? If you were walking down a, a, a dark alley, would you prefer to be alone or with a group of people? Because there's safety in numbers. And therefore, Jesus... Did he just call one guy to follow him? No. He said, I'm calling these guys to partner with me. And then those 12 was going to find people that was going to partner with them. And quickly now, because those part, people partnered and other people partnered, we have the gospel here today. Amen. But we got to continue the work. We can't let it stop. Sorry about that. I don't know what to do about that. It doesn't matter. I'll try not to do it again. But it's used 187 times. And each time the writer says, let us, he's encouraging us in the three virtues of our Christianity. In faith, in our hope, in our love. It's interesting. First off, he mentions faith. Because of, because of Christ, we have the privilege of drawing near to God in worship, prayer, and faith. I am always amazed. And I will... I, I will always be amazed, probably until I die, that the God of glory will allow me the privilege and the opportunity to draw near to him. I just can't, I, honestly, it, it blows my mind. It, I, I've been in the ministry now for 26 years, and, and it still blows my mind that God chose me, he saved me, he set me apart, and now he says, I want you to come close to me. But he doesn't just say it to the pastors. The book of James. If you will draw near to him, what's the promise? He will, he'll draw near to you. He's, God is not expecting you to do it all. He's doing his part. As I'm loving him, as I'm, a grow, as, I'm, as I'm growing in my relationship with Christ, as I'm becoming all that God wants me to be, I'm drawing near to him. God is drawing near to me too, man. Isn't that, does that not just absolutely amaze you? That God, that there's seven billion people in there, and God is concerned about you? personally? And he says, I'm going to draw near to you. And and he allows us to do this. And then he tells us how in verse 22, he says, let us draw near with a true heart, full and full assurance of faith. In other words, this is why I struggle with without doubting. 
He said, come to me with all, with, 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 with all the faith you can muster. In full assurance, without any doubts, without wavering. <sighs> Do you ever have doubts? Yeah. Your pastor sometimes has doubts. This has been a rough week with the tournament. People canceling. I'm like, okay, God. And, and, and about 35 times I gave it to the Lord this week. Probably about 45, actually. Uh, woke up in a sweat one night and said, okay, Lord, I got to give this back to you. Are, are you like that too? Where you give it to God and then take it back and then give it back? Yeah. It's kind of been that kind of week. And I don't have no idea what this week's going to be like. But I got to come to Christ. Maybe this message isn't for anybody but me. In full confidence. Without doubting. Because in reality, Dad, <laughs> sorry, that was a little bit of Spanish. In reality, it says the Copa del Calvario, but it's really the work of the Lord. So let us draw near with, with a true heart, in full assurance, with our hearts sprinkled, clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with, the pure, with, with, with pure water. Let us, let us. Let us get involved. Let us leave our fingerprints on people's lives. Let us touch the valley for the cause of Christ. Let us, let us, let us be involved in what God is doing. L let us corporately seek to bring other people to the knowledge of the truth. Let us, let us be the ones who makes a difference here. Now listen, it doesn't just stop here, but, but let us, let us look at the world the way God looks at the world and let us be involved in sending missionaries to other people. Let us, this, uh, this Monday through Friday, work together as we train and we teach little children about the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, then, and then let us, even though we're going to be tired come Saturday and Sunday we're going to be totally wiped out. And then Monday we're going to have the hot weather. Let us work together at the tournament to show the love of Christ to a Latino community that needs Christ. Let us. Let us encourage each other. Let us. He tells us how to come to him in full assurance with, 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 and, and an entire confidence. And in verse 23, hope. He urges us to persevere. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith or hope without wavering. And he tells us why, Johan. Because he, God, is going to be faithful to you. How awesome is this? You come, Chris, to, to, and give this VBS to Christ, and God says, I'm coming to you. Oh, how awesome is that? Persevere. You're going to need perseverance this week. I am not really a, really a kid, kid person. I know, probably hard to believe. I like to stir them up and then leave them with you guys. Um, I'm really good at that, getting them all cranked up and then giving them to somebody else. I'm going to be a great grandpa. 20 more days. Just thought I'd throw that in for free. Uh, I'm going to be a grandpa in 20 days. Uh, persevere. It's easy to quit when the going gets tough. It's easy to get discouraged when, when it does, it's not working out the way you thought it would work out. It's easy to get frustrated and just say, you know, I'm just happy with the status quo and that's enough for me. No. We've got to persevere. We got, let us, let us come together, let us encourage each other, let us strengthen each other, let us draw our strength from one another, and our strength comes from God, and let us continue the work, let us persevere. Amen. We don't get weary in well-doing because we, God says, you're going to weep, you're going you're to reap if you faint not. And you may weep along the way, but God says, you will reap if you faint not. Do you believe God's promises? Amen. Are you going to persevere? He's writing to the believers and he's saying to them, stay strong. Don't run. Persevere. Continue in the faith. For he had promised is faithful. We have a strong incentive to persevere in the faith because God is absolutely faithful to us. And are you ready for this? Matthew 6 says, God is faithful and he cannot lie. Amen. I can lie. 
You can lie. God can't lie. If he says it, he's going to do it. We must be steadfast to the end in faith, hope, love, and good works. And then he urges us to love. I got a lot to talk about about this. This is beautiful. Verse 24 and 25. Let's read it real quick. And let us consider. Let us consider how to encourage, to stir up one another to love and good works. Let us understand how to stir each other up to love and good works. When going through trials, believers are to show concern one for another. This is expressed through our good works. We are to continue caring for one another, whatever the cost. This care is shown by meeting together for fellowship and mutual encouragement. In the, in the King James Version, he uses the word, instead of consider how, he uses the word to provoke. It's a very interesting word. That word actually means to incite or to uh, excite, to encourage, to provoke somebody to love and good works. So part of my responsibility as a pastor is to incite you, to excite you to understand that this great cause of evangelism and discipleship has been entrusted to us and to encourage and incite you to be participants in this. Amen? Amen. And when that happens, when that happens, the pews will be full. And we won't have to worry about the offerings or our budget. It's going to be fine. We approved the budget Wednesday night. A little bit less than last year. I told the people that if you were here, you heard this. We don't have a budget problem. We have a people problem. We, have, we don't have enough people. Amen? Amen? I'm not worried about the money stuff. I'm worried about the people. When you go, when you're driving up and down a Taze Valley Road, look at all the people running. And ask yourself, how many of them knows Christ as their Savior? And see what difference you can make in their lives. You see... We're never called to be selfish. You don't ever even see the emphasis of that in the Bible. Rather, we're called to love and to work. And we're to deny ourselves, and we're to take up our cross. We're to follow Jesus. That's the tough part. So I've got a couple of questions real quick. Are we loving each other as the Lord would have us to love? In here. Are we loving each other the way we're supposed to love each other in here? I wonder what would happen if we said this group is going to move over here to this group and you have to talk. Be really uncomfortable because I don't like him. And I don't like her. And I don't like that short little pastor guy either. Listen. Listen. Are we loving in here like we're supposed to love? Are you loving, are you loving in our partnership right here? Are you loving your partners in the ministry the way Jesus wants you to love your partners in the ministry? Second thing is, I believe we have to ask ourselves this question. Are we loving those outside of the church as God would have us to love them? Man, that's where we got to get. We got to get out here. You see, every time you walk out the back door of that church, you're a missionary, right? Are y'all with me? When you walk out the back door of the church, you're a missionary. You're walking into the mission field. You're walking into a place that is in darkness, although there's the sun for light. You're looking at people who are spiritually dead without the Lord Jesus Christ, without hope, without help who needs help and needs healing for their soul. And you may be the only ones who will take that message to them. And as we partner together, we can do this together. And we can do it individually, but we've got to be involved in loving people outside of this church the way Jesus loves people outside of the church. People need loved. God is love. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. But God demonstrated his love towards us, and when while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let us see that. Let us understand this. Let us capture the, 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 the ministry that God has for us at Calvary Baptist Church. Let us be used by God to fill these pews up and that pew up. And let us be involved in bringing people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us see people being baptized. Let us, let us participate. Don't be stagnant. I'm not interested in being a pastor of a stagnant church. Not interested. That's why we want to get this thing fired up. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now come on. Please come on. Please partner with me. Please capture the vision. Please. And I believe it's from God. And I'm pleading with you. Please. We've got to get it. We've got to provoke each other to love and to good works. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, it says this, In the same way, let your light so shine before others, so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Good works will never produce salvation. You've got to understand that. But good works are the product of your salvation. At salvation, a, a, a miracle happens at the moment of salvation. At the moment that we repent of our sins and we ask Jesus Christ to be our Savior. At the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit comes and he lives within our lives. And, and then you are no longer the Lord of your life, but you have allowed the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your life. And he then becomes the Lord of your life. And, and a, an amazing thing happens. There's a transaction that has taken place. And the Bible says that you have been made a new creation. You are not the same. You have been bought with a price. And, and as you come to know Christ as your Savior, and you, you're, you're joining with other believers in, in the house of God, and then there's this partnership that we agree that we've got to come together. We've got to work together because we've got to fill the church together for the glory of God. It's about partnership. It's about seeing where you fit and, and, and fulfilling your rule. It's about being uncomfortable a little bit. Like I said, if this, if this side had to move to this side, you would feel really uncomfortable. You want me to do what? I would never ask you because you'd shoot me. But it's okay to be a little uncomfortable from time to time. It's like before I became a Christian, I could sin and I could enjoy it. I could steal and it was okay. But when I gave my life to Christ, I mean, there's a lot of things that changed. I just can't enjoy it anymore. Can't even enjoy a bad thought anymore. It's actually pretty good, you know what I'm saying? I can't. And I don't want to enjoy it because I want to draw near to God. I want him to draw near to me. I don't want to see God do some amazing things, but I can't, I, I can't continue because I'm different. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. Let me read this to you, and you know this already. But it says, For by grace have you been saved through faith, and it's not of your own doing, but it's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that not any can boast. For we, plural, we, are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for, you know what the next phrase is? Good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You were never saved, and I'm going to say it again, you were never saved to be a spectator. You are saved to be a participant. Jesus shed his blood for you. He did everything that it was necessary for you to get to know him as, his, as your savior. And once we give our lives to Christ, we should be so dedicated to him that we want to serve him. We should be so dedicated to Christ that corporately we want to see this place filled for the glory of God. You know what I would like to see? I'd like to see a lot of people that don't know Christ in our church. I know that that bothers some of you. That's okay. You'll get right with God sometime. Because if we have a lot of people that don't know Christ as their Savior, they're going to hear about Christ. 
And I believe, I truly believe God will do a great work. And God will begin saving people again in our church. Do you desire that? Do you want that? Does Calvary Baptist Church want that? I'm asking you, do you want that? I long for that. I long to see people come to Christ. I, I'm broken for this. I, I, I carry a tremendous burden for this. You gotta understand, it's a big burden and it's a great burden and I will carry it till the day I die. But I'm asking you to partner with me. I'm asking you to get the vision from Almighty God because we have the message that will change the life. And we can't just be the spectators. We got to participate. Calvary, I beg you. And I believe God begs you. Catch the vision. Catch the vision. In James chapter 2, verses 14 through 18, it says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, it's dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. So, we got a partnership in this. We got to get busy. Time's running out. I've had enough conversations with Pastor Millard Mitchell. And he told me the same thing. We've got to get the church motivated again. He said he tried to do it when he was here too. And he struggled with it just like I'm struggling with it. Because of our own natural tendency to want to hide from the cause of Christ rather than run to it and embrace it. And that's why I'm asking you not to do it alone. Let's do it together. It's amazing what happens when we work together. It's biblically inconsistent to say that someone has been saved but has not been changed. Think about that. Because God says you are a new what? You're a new creature in Christ. It's biblically inconsistent to say that someone has been saved but has not been changed. Many people go through an outward motion of giving their lives to Christ, but no lifestyle change follows. Is that real salvation or is it dead faith? I'm really not the judge of that. God is. When you walk into a dark room and you flip a switch, you expect light, correct? If no light appears, you're rightly to assume that something's wrong. It would be logically inconsistent to say that the light is on when the room is still pitch black. Light naturally dispels darkness. When a dark heart receives the light of salvation, it is illuminated. John chapter 12 and verse 46. Priorities change. Desires change. Outlooks change. Life, life is seen clearly for some for the first time. If the darkness of sin continues, can we assume rightly that maybe a light has never come on? Listen. Don't be satisfied with the status quo. Don't be satisfied with just being a a spectator. Come on and join the fun. You talk about fun, serving Jesus. I'm going to finish with this illustration, with this story. It happened Thursday. A lot of the vacation Bible school workers went down to Mayberry's. 
And there was this poor lady there. And I, 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 you know me, I talked to everybody. And I said, how you doing today? She said, oh, I'm doing pretty good. I got new meds. I thought she was kidding until she told me her story. You see, people just need a little bit of time. And she said, my husband is 40 years old. His name is Jeremy, and he is in heart failure, um, congestive heart failure. He has congestive heart failure. And she's got a one-and-a-half-year-old baby, and think that her life is just totally out of control. And I, I looked at her, and I said, I'm going to pray for you. Oh, and, and, and she started to cry. <laughs> you were there. And you know what that cost me? Ningun centavo, not one penny. And I gave her my phone number. Call me if I can help you. Come to Calvary Baptist Church because this is a place of hope. I want you to be my guest at Calvary Baptist Church. This is going to be your place of hope and help and healing. Is that what you want for Calvary Baptist Church? I can't want it alone. Yesterday at the food pantry, sitting right there, a lady says, I need to talk to you. And I said, I'd be honored to talk to you. She's on oxygen. She told me how her son has been in prison for the last six years and how in August he's going to get out of prison. And she said, you know what I want? or what I need, I need a bed for my son that's coming home. He knows about Kairos. (laughs) Kind of cool, huh? Because we support Kairos. And I said, man, if I have to buy the bed, I'm gonna get you a bed. We'll got till August to find this lady a bed. Then after that, Anna Smith comes and gets me and said, there's a young man that needs to talk to you. He wants to see the pastor. <laughs> da da da, the pastor. <laughs> and he begins to tell me why he can't trust God. He was an addict. He lost his family. His wife. He he he's clean now. He lost his family. His wife was an addict. After he pays his child support, he has sixty dollars a month to live on and he said how can I trust God that does that and I got to tell him my story and my story is a lot like his story as far as a mom and a dad and when we got done he was smiling from ear to ear and he said I think I'm getting it he said you know that story of the guy who suffered in the Bible I said you mean Job he said yeah I said, let's talk about that for a minute. I said, who attacked Job? Well, God. I said, no. No. God allowed Satan to attack Job, but God did not attack Job. And his whole face changed. And I said, let me ask you, who do you think is attacking you? He said, it's not God because God loves you. It's the adversary trying to destroy you. And, of course, he had to leave. His people was out in the car waiting for him. He's got my number and praying. He's call, he calls me. Listen, we're doing this together, aren't we? We're doing it together. Please, capture it. Verses 1 to 5. I didn't put all this scripture up there because I want you to bring your Bible or your electronic device with your Bible on it, okay? We're going to t- I want this morning to speak to you on the subject of Christ's present ministry in heaven. And I want us to go to Hebrews. This is a fantastic book. It, the book of Hebrews deserves to be read and studied over and over because it is such a rich, rich book about how...